This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, another week, another episode of Halo. God damn, man, are you guys watching this shit? It has been brutal. I went into this show really pumped, but now I'm like, please, no season two, make it stop, kill it with fire. Paramount may be letting me down, but video games sure haven't been. This week I checked out Trek to Yomi and Achilles Legends Untold. I'm still playing way too much Vampire Survivors, game of the year by the way. And speaking of vampires, I'm about to go hands on with V Rising this week, that vampire survival game from the makers of Battle Ride. I think that looks pretty cool, I'm kind of pumped for that one to be honest. For what feels like the first time in weeks, this week has been bereft of any cataclysmic industry shaking announcements, which is nice. It's nice not to feel like this industry is in a constant state of crisis and catastrophe. Still plenty of smaller stories, announcements, new releases and more to check out, so let's do it. Here comes the news. Let's circle back to that Square Enix news that broke last week. You know, the one where they sold three talented studios and a whole bunch of blockbuster IP so they could buy more monkey JPEGs? Yeah, that one. While we knew that Square Enix had offloaded the majority of its Western operations and IPs, there were some outstanding question marks relating to Square's other Western titles, namely Just Cause, Outriders, and Life is Strange. Turns out that Square Enix are keeping the publishing rights for these titles, though it isn't 100% clear why. This is just me talking in here, but I'm guessing that maybe Embracer just wasn't keen on them. Just Cause has never sold a truckload and it's always been a little confused as a franchise, I think. The Life is Strange stuff has done well for itself in that those that love it really love it, but I'm gonna guess that's a pretty niche audience since narrative driven games like this don't rake in big cash. When it comes to Outriders, maybe the reason Embracer didn't want it is because it didn't make any money? Developer People Can Fly issued financial statements this week and in so doing, they clarified that they have not received any royalty revenue from Square Enix, which would have been paid if the game had covered its development, marketing, and distribution costs. People Can Fly then issued a statement on the matter clarifying that revenue didn't cover costs, and then went so far as to say that revenue might never cover costs. Quote, there can be no assurance that net proceeds from the sale of Outriders in future periods will be sufficient for the publisher to recover the costs incurred and to pay royalties to the group, end quote. This is a real bummer for me because yes, Outriders was super busted at launch, absolutely, but at the same time, these guys were just trying to make an honest video game. A looter shooter releasing in 2021 with no microtransactions. None. They just wanted to put out a game that you pay for once and then you're done. I would have loved to have seen this go on gangbusters so that it could serve as a sort of good news story to present to executives reluctant to invest in this way, but the crippling technical issues that hampered Outriders launch window seem to have doomed it to become a cautionary tale that those same investors will now invoke when arguing why games need microtransactions in order to make money. There is an expansion for Outriders announced for the end of June and it's looking pretty great to be honest. Hopefully that breathes a bit of new life into what I think is a really worthwhile franchise and I hope people can fly choose to stick with this one come what may. Speaking of Square Enix, we got yet another small update on Final Fantasy 16 this week. Last week, Square's golden goose Yoshi P said that the game was in the final stages of its development. And this week, he's again spilled the beans. Speaking during a Final Fantasy 14 livestream, Yoshi P said that Final Fantasy 16 was now in its polish and debugging phase, reigniting hopes that we may yet see a 2022 release for this, which to be honest, is looking increasingly likely given the way that Yoshi P keeps talking about it. He also said that the next trailer for the game is prepared and is ready to go but it's being held back by undisclosed factors. Odds are this is Sony who are going to want to drop the trailer at either a dedicated state of play or perhaps in and around when E3 might have otherwise been. No doubt that trailer will offer up a release date for the title so we won't be wandering on that subject much longer. While we're on the topic, we are fast approaching the time slot when E3 would have been held and while E3 itself is a no-show, publishers and organizers aren't letting that hallowed hype window go to waste. Last week, Xbox announced that they were hosting a showcase on June 12th, and this week, Jeff Keighley himself formally announced the Summer Games Fest showcase, scheduled for 11am PT on June 9th. This is unsurprising given that Keighley has long been angling to supplant E3, a worthwhile goal given how badly the ESA have mismanaged it over the years. If Jeff Keighley does take over E3, does it become Key 3? Get it? Keighley 3? What, you don't like my jokes? Well, how about I make you an offer you can't refuse? 
Mafia 4 is in development. How's that for a segue? The confirmation came this week with the resignation of current Hangar 13 studio boss Hayden Blackman, who is leaving the company to pursue other things. No specific information on what those other things are. As this unfolded, a source close to the matter confirmed to Kotaku that a new Mafia was in the works. And other outlets reported that it will be built in Unreal Engine 5 and it will be a prequel focusing on the rise of the Salieri family. This is all unconfirmed at the moment, so take it with a grain of salt, but it'd be nice if it was true. Let's talk about Activision Blizzard, that old chestnut. Yet another rough week for the embattled publisher, but especially for old mate Bobby Cotty, because this week he got sued by the state of New York and more specifically by their teachers, police, and firefighters. For real, the New York City Employees Retirement System manages the pensions for a bunch of New York State employees, and that body owns stock in Activision Blizzard. That body has brought suit against Bobby Kotick, alleging that his actions hurt the value of the publisher, resulting in a lower share and sale price to Microsoft during the acquisition. The argument goes that if Bobby wasn't negotiating in the midst of a crisis that he himself helped create, shareholders would have gotten a better deal. And I mean, yeah, they're probably right. They would have. So fuck Bobby Kotick and Godspeed NYC. May you triumph. Activision isn't just feeling legal pressures at the moment, mind you. It's also feeling revenue pressures across pretty much every one of its franchises. Case in point, Call of Duty Vanguard significantly underperformed versus expectations last year, and when discussing the matter in their annual report to shareholders, Activision knew exactly where to lay the blame. At the feet of World War II itself. Activision's statement read, quote, The game's World War II setting didn't resonate with some of our community, end quote. So the issue wasn't the game as much as it was the source material, see? And to be fair, no one's ever made a good World War II game, so I could totally see where Activision were coming from on this one. We already knew that Vanguard was a bit of a dud, but it's surprising to see how quickly interest in Overwatch 2 has fallen since its closed beta commenced last week. On launch day, Overwatch 2 smashed records, with over 1.4 million concurrent viewers on Twitch making it the sixth most watched game of all time on the streaming platform. The day after, viewership dropped 94%, and now just over a week later, viewership has dropped 99%. At the time of writing, Overwatch had around 6k concurrent viewers, a far, far cry from the 1.4 million just a short time earlier, and an overall disappointing figure for a long anticipated sequel, especially one trying to maintain a strong esports presence. Obviously, these huge day one views were because of Twitch drops, where people who watched for a length of time were able to guarantee access to Overwatch 2's closed beta. But Blizzard were crowing about these day one numbers, so they have to own the drop off as well. You can't have it one way and not the other. Blizzard have released a blog post discussing the roadmap for the beta, promising more content in the weeks and months to come, but it's hard to argue that these opening weeks have been anything other than a disaster for Blizzard, cementing fears that Overwatch 2 is a sequel in name only, and placing a very, very heavy burden on the PvE side of the game to justify that price tag. Final piece of Blizzard news for the week is best introduced by Wyatt Cheng himself. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones, phone, right? That's right, this week marked the reveal of Warcraft Arclight Rumble, one of the two mobile Warcraft games that Blizzard was working on. The other one was a Pokemon Go style offering that sadly got canned. This one is looking a lot like Clash Royale, but with some key differences, most notably the inclusion of a single player campaign spread across dozens of maps and facing off against a variety of iconic Warcraft heroes and villains. I know that most people roll their eyes when they see this stuff, but as someone who had to quit Clash Royale because of how hopelessly addicted I became to it and how angry it would make me, I'm low-key looking forward to this one. We don't have a release window for this one yet, but you can pre-register on mobile platforms and Battle.net for more info. Though to be clear, it is not coming to PC or consoles, it is a mobile exclusive. So, you know, you better have a phone, like Wyatt says. From one embattled publisher to the next, it appears as though Ubisoft CEO Yves Guillemot may not be as eager to sell as earlier reported. A report from Deal Reporter has a source that says Guillemot is looking to partner with private equity to acquire the company on the condition that the Guillemot family can remain in charge of it. I find this report a little hard to believe, since the Gilmore family aren't really in the business as much as they used to be, and the sexual harassment scandals that have rocked the publisher aren't going away so long as the Gilmore family remain in charge. Then there's the current issues with the release portfolio. Assassin's Creed Infinity is years away, Beyond Good and Evil 2 is basically vaporware at this point, Ghost Recon Breakpoint flopped spectacularly hard, and the reveal of the Ghost Recon Battle Royale game went so badly that Ubisoft have fallen deathly silent on the matter, to the point where people are asking like, is that game still coming out? Like what's, what's happened with that one? 
Then there's Skull and Bones looking really rough, the decommissioning of Hyperscape, failed mobile projects, the list goes on. Some really serious challenges facing Ubisoft in both the near and far term. And I'd be very surprised if Gilmore wanted to tackle them all himself rather than just cash out and move to a quiet chateau in the mountains. Either way, I predict something's going to happen because Ubisoft are in too much trouble to not look for either a life raft or an emergency exit. One game I left off that previous list was the Prince of Persia Sands of Time remake, which has been stuck in its own version of development hell as it suffered delay after delay. This week, Ubisoft trotted out yet another delay.jpg, announcing that the development of the title would move from Ubisoft Pune and Mumbai to Ubisoft Montreal. Montreal, the birthplace of the franchise. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of issues going on behind the scenes with this one, since whenever a game moves from one publisher to the other, there's clearly a story there. The gameplay reveal from a while back was pretty roundly roasted for looking more like a remaster than a remake. There were some pretty ghetto visuals. We don't have a new release date for this one yet, but I'd be very surprised if it shipped this year. Hey, here's something I know you guys love. Fortnite. Wait, come back. No, seriously, this is actually kind of cool. This week, Xbox were giving themselves a big old pat on the back for how well xCloud is doing, their cloud streaming service that lets you play games without needing local hardware. Think Stadia, but you know, still alive. Xbox have good reason to crow about the service since more than 10 million people have now used it, which is pretty great given that it's still rolling out in a number of territories and a lot of people don't even know it exists yet. To help get the word out, Xbox announced that commencing right now, you can play Fortnite through xCloud for free. Typically, to play anything through xCloud, you need a Game Pass Ultimate subscription, which sets you back like 15 bucks a month. This offer doesn't require a subscription, so right now, absolutely anyone can start playing Fortnite on their TV, their tablet, or their phone using xCloud. That is an especially big deal for those who use Apple devices, since Epic and Apple's legal 1v1 in mid lane has meant that Fortnite has remained banned from the App Store. Now those with an iPhone or iPad can play Fortnite for free using xCloud. That's pretty cool, and you gotta wonder what other free-to-play titles will get the same treatment. It makes good business sense for a publisher to cover the cloud costs if it means they can get more players into their games, spending money on in-game purchases and all that. I'm all but certain we'll see many more titles following suit in the coming months. To further bolster xCloud's footprint, Xbox are apparently looking to ship both a streaming puck and a Samsung app before the end of the year. The report comes from VentureBeat, who are saying that as part of Microsoft's Play Anywhere initiative, you'll soon be able to purchase a little dongle thing that you can plug into the back of your TV that'll let you access Game Pass through xCloud. If you own a Samsung TV, then you might be able to sidestep the dongle altogether since apparently Xbox have been working with Samsung for some time now to develop an app that would serve as a window to Game Pass through xCloud. That is a pretty crazy future, one in which the barriers between consoles are all but pulled down. Want to play Starfield in November but don't have an Xbox or a PC? Just pull up an app on your TV, pay 15 bucks for a month of Game Pass Ultimate and you're in. Not bad. Obviously, Netflix can see the way the wind is blowing on this one, and they too are trying to spin up a gaming presence, but it isn't going so well. I mean, to this day, I have not heard from a single person who has actually played a game through Netflix or from Netflix or... Well, I actually don't even know how to phrase that because I don't know if you play games through the Netflix app on your TV or like you can only play them on your phone. Like I live and breathe video games every minute of my entire fucking life. And I still cannot tell you anything about this service, which I think says at least something about how little cut through it's achieved since it launched last year. Netflix aren't giving up though. In addition to cracking down on password sharing, Netflix are betting big on video games as a means of recovering from their huge share drop price earlier this year. They're saying that by the end of 2022, there's gonna be 50 games available on the service. What will those games be? Mobile games. I hate to break it to Netflix, but we already have storefronts for those, and most of those games are free, even if they are pretty trash. If Netflix are hoping to enter the gaming market properly, then I think they're gonna have to try a little bit harder than just mobile games, but I don't know, who will see. A few quick bits to top us off. The WWE are top rope dropping onto the world of video games. Did any of that make sense? I don't watch wrestling, so I just threw some words out there. Anyway, the WWE have said they are pleased with how WWE 2K is performing and have signed a deal for an upcoming wrestling RPG. 
Little do they know that that already exists in the form of upcoming indie WrestleQuest, but good luck to them. Shenmue 4 probably isn't happening. No surprises there, given that Shenmue 3 wasn't good for much other than meme compilation videos. Still, Yu Suzuki himself confirmed it this week when he said that there are currently no concrete plans for a Shenmue 4, leaving his planned 11-part saga still 8 games shy. District 9 and Chappie director Neil Blomkamp is involved in a game studio by the name of Gunzilla Games, and they've announced their next project. A Battle Royale shooter. Another one. Hooray. No other details except it's being built on Unreal 5 and it's third person and it's cyberpunk sci-fi themed. And finally, 2K are apparently working on a Rocket League competitor. It's called Gravity Goal and it'll go from four wheels to two, ditching the cars of Rocket League and replacing them with Tron style motorcycles. Much like Tron, you'll also be able to throw discs at other people's bikes to damage them all while trying to put a big floaty ball in a net. Sounds pretty cool, I'd play it. Apparently it's out sometime this year since it hit closed alpha last year, slated for PS5, Xbox Series consoles and PC. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well kicking things off is Outward Definitive Edition. This was an interesting release, an open world Souls-like RPG survival hybrid released back in 2019 that looked as weird and as janky as Morrowind and in 2019 that's as much a compliment as it is an indictment. Still it had this X factor that some people really clung to and I definitely remember seeing this on at least a few Game of the Year lists back then. The Definitive Edition includes both the post-launch DLCs, the Sauroborians and the Three Brothers, as well as a heap of rebalancing and quality of life stuff across the whole game. If you already own the base game and the Three Brothers DLC, then this is a free upgrade. Otherwise, you can purchase it standalone when it hits on May 17th. Sons of the Forest is the sequel to one of the highest rated survival games ever released, The Forest. The sequel tasks you with tracking down a billionaire who, wouldn't you know it, has ended up on a creepy zombie infested island. What is it with billionaires and private islands? Wait, don't answer that. I don't want the FBI lurking in my comments. Anyway, Sons of the Forest got a release window this year, sometime in October, arriving exclusive to PC. Redout 2. So, since Sony have made it all but abundantly clear that we are never getting a new Wipeout game, and since Nintendo have made it all but abundantly clear that we're never getting another F-Zero game, Redout is the last refuge for fast-paced, edm fueled anti-grav racing fans like myself. The first Redout was a solid title that hit while we still had high hopes for the genre, so it kind of got overlooked. With Redout 2 now being the only bar in town, I expect a few more nostalgia drunk patrons will end up staggering through its doors. It's looking fast and colourful and the soundtrack is already delivering. I'm keen for this one, it's hitting all platforms on May 26th. Thymesia. This is one I shouted out quite a while back in my Put This On Your Radar segment. It's an action RPG with Souls-like elements, but the focus is very firmly on the action RPG elements, with fast-paced combat and acrobatics more akin to a spectacle fighter than anything else. This one has a demo out right now, which has been getting great Great feedback. The game got an official release date this week, 10th of August, arriving on all platforms by the Switch. Now this next one is special, XO1. I stumbled on this one ages ago while seeing a clip of it on Twitter and I was immediately like, I want to go to there. It's one of those flow games that I'm a sucker for, just gliding around and soaking up the vibes while you do cool ass flying saucer shit. This one arrived last year exclusive to PC and Xbox, but the developers have just announced that the game will make its way to Sony Pony Island, arriving for both PS4 and 5, with the PS5 version supporting 120Hz refresh and haptic feedback. No specific date for this one yet, but it's slated for northern summer of this year. You might have missed it, but Apex Legends is getting a mobile port, and while I haven't played it yet, I have checked out some gameplay, and I gotta say, looking pretty damn solid. The mobile battle royale market is pretty much the biggest mobile gaming market at this point, raking in billions of dollars across games like PUBG, Fortnite and others, so it's unsurprising that EA would want to get in on that action. This week Respawn confirmed that the game will be launching sometime this month for both iOS and Android. It will of course be free to play, so you can pre-register for access on the Android store or on Respawn's website if you're on iOS. And finally, the only delay announcement for this week is one that had me literally laughing out loud. The day before. Okay, so if you haven't heard of this one before, it was revealed last year with a trailer that came out of nowhere and basically looked like The Division 3, especially in the visuals department, since the whole thing looked like a one-to-one -one recreation of Massive's New York City, except all souped up and next-gen. That would be fine, except for the fact that the studio behind this, Fantastic, have never put out anything close to that level of visual fidelity. The last game was released back in December 2021. It's called Prop Night. It's a multiplayer hide and seek game. So already I was like, mm, something doesn't add up here, man. 
Later on, some gameplay trailers were released that looked just as scripted as the original trailer did, so I certainly didn't put any stock in those either. The game was meant to release six weeks from now, and to this point, not a single person has played it outside the studio, and we've seen no closed or open beta testing. This is for a multiplayer MMO survival game, by the way. So, last week, the developer was hyping up a big news drop, and everyone was hopeful that this would be the announcement of a beta window so we could all actually play this for ourselves. Turns out the announcement they were hyping up was a one-year delay announcement. The game will now ship sometime in March of next year, and they're also moving the game to Unreal Engine 5. So, like, six weeks before release, they announced they're moving to a new graphics engine? To be fair, they were building this in Unreal Engine 4, and a number of developers have confirmed for me that the move to 5 can be done inside of a year, but that would be a fairly bare-bones port, and likely wouldn't give you the required time to make use of the more advanced features that Unreal 5 provides. So look, here's what I think. I really do wish these developers the best. I hope they release their game, and it looks as good as the trailers, and it runs beautifully. But right now, I just remember all of those old Ubisoft trailers we used to see at E3, which look incredible, but then the final product is many, many orders of magnitude less impressive. I don't mean to sound like a cynic, but I look forward to seeing the trailer versus release comparison videos for this game when it ships in March next year, if it even ships then, which I kind of feel like it wouldn't. This is Steam's most wishlisted game, by the way, so the hype for this is nuts. Please take my advice, do not pre-order this. Not until we know a hell of a lot more, there are a lot of red flags for this one. So what came out last week? A pretty lean week of releases, but Loot River did arrive rather unexpectedly actually, since its release date announcement kind of snuck up on us. This is sitting at a strong 75 on Open Critic, with reviews pointing to strong visual design, nice combat, and a neat trick in the platform movement stuff. The Steam reviews are less charitable, with the game currently sitting at a mix 60%. Game Informer really liked it, scoring it an 8.5 and saying, quote, Loot River reimagines some of its inspiration's best elements, offering players a chance to sail cleverly through each environment, grow powerful enough to slice up once impossible threats, and unravel a story that smartly weaves into its gameplay." End quote. Screen Rant was less enthused, scoring it 2 out of 5 stars and saying, quote, Loot River is a frustrating experience which clearly needed more development time, but hopefully the game finds its footing post-launch. A reminder that this one is on Game Pass, so if you'd like to check it out for yourself, that's a good way to do it. Warhammer 4 40k Chaos Gate Demon Hunter arrived exclusive for PC last week, and this one has made the 40k community fairly happy. Critics love this one, it's sitting at a strong 83 on Open Critic, but the Steam reviews are a lot more critical, currently sitting at a mixed 69%. Nice. PC Gamer were big fans, scoring it an 87, saying, quote, a layered and engaging space opera that triumphs both on and off the battlefield, end quote. The last release of the week was a little indie title that managed to cut through and get a whole lot of eyeballs on it, Trek to Yomi. I'm pretty glad about that, by the way, since I think this game does deserve the attention, but there are some big caveats in that statement. I reviewed this one, link below the like button. I enjoyed it for its earnest homage to classic Japanese cinema, its simple but taut plot, and its strong sound design. Man, the gameplay kinda sucked. It wasn't the worst gameplay ever, it wasn't like offensively bad, but it was just so nuff nuff. Like bare minimum, just scraping by kind of combat that felt so half-baked compared to the polish and shine that exuded from every inch of this game's presentation. The gameplay side of things hasn't gone unnoticed with critic scores sitting at a 73 on Open Critic and Steam reviews sitting at a mixed 69%. Reviews are pretty consistent across the board. Game looks beautiful, plays either mid or poorly, depending on your tolerance. It's also on Game Pass, so if you'd like to check it out, you can. I do recommend at least booting it up. It's five hours long. It really does have some very special presentation that's worth experiencing. So if you're going with the right expectations, you'll likely enjoy yourself. So what's coming out this week? Huge week of releases this week, actually. Even if most of the titles are either on the indie or double A end of the spectrum, kicking things off is We Were Here Forever, which is the latest installment in the We Were Here series. This is a co-op puzzle adventure game, which you don't see too many of outside of Hazelight Studios offering. So it's nice to see this sort of stuff. This arrives today for PC, but a PlayStation and Xbox port is promised for some time in the future. Euden Chronicles Rising arrives today for PC and Xbox, where it will be a day one Game Pass release. 
This is the prelude to the highly anticipated Suikoden spiritual successor titled Iuidan Chronicles 100 Heroes. That one isn't out until next year, but this 2D JRPG is meant to set up the world and introduce at least some of the characters. Previews for this one have been a little mid, so it'll be interesting to see how this one lands. Salt and Sacrifice is one that I've been keeping an eye on for a while now since I sadly missed the first game and I wanted to make sure I checked out the sequel. This is the sequel to the very well received Salt and Sanctuary, a brutal 2D Souls-like that broke some new ground when it released back in 2016 since it was one of the first games to successfully deliver a compelling Souls-like experience in 2D. The sequel arrives today, exclusive to the Epic Game Store and PlayStation consoles. You gotta guess that that exclusive window expires after a year, but that is a guess. We'll find out later on, I'm sure. Certainly one of the most poignant and pertinent indies to have released in the past decade is this War of Mine, which inverts the Warfront experience that most games embrace. Instead of being the soldier at the front line, blowing up waves of foes, you play as a group of scared, huddling civilians, desperately trying to scavenge for food, water and supplies while dodging sniper fire and collateral damage. The Final Cut edition of the game adds new characters, maps, new quests and more. That's been available on PC for some time, but today it arrives for both PS5 and Xbox Series consoles. Certainly one of the most charming and chill indies to have been released in the past decade is Unpacking from Australian developer Witchbeam. Ostensibly just a chill game about unpacking boxes and putting stuff wherever you please, soon subtly transforms into a more contemplative experience where you pick through the clues to try and piece together a picture of someone's life. This one landed on more than a few Game of the Year lists last year when it was exclusive to PC and Xbox through Game Pass. As of today, it'll also be available on PlayStation, so that's nice. Source of Madness is that 2D roguelike with a very, very committed Lovecraftian vibe. As I mentioned earlier, it's been in early access for a while now, but today it ships 1.0. I am looking forward to getting stuck into this one this week. Achilles Legends Untold describes itself as an isometric Souls-like action RPG. I've actually played this one, or at least a little bit of it. I got sent an early code and was messing about with it. It's looking okay so far. Combat is feeling a little rough, but it controls well enough. Visuals look simple, but they still get the job done. I'm interested in seeing more of this one since I'm a sucker for this setting and it supports co-op play, which is always nice. This one is arriving in early access on the 12th, so there's presumably still a long wait until release. I will be checking in on this one from time to time. And finally, big week for Sam Raimi. Last week, he released Doctor Strange 2. I didn't love that one, by the way, but let's not get sidetracked. This week, Remy is releasing an Evil Dead video game. Well, it's not actually him releasing it, but it's based on the movie he directed, so that's close enough. Evil Dead, the game, is one of those asymmetric PvP games where you can play as either desperate survivors or as the demonic forces trying to chase them down. I've seen some gameplay of this, most notably a gameplay preview featuring the legend himself, Bruce Campbell, and I gotta say, this is looking pretty cool. I really wish this was coming to Game Pass, since it's a lot easier to get a group of friends together to play this sort of stuff when it's on Game Pass. But so far, it hasn't been announced for Game Pass, so that is unlikely. Either way, this will be available on almost all platforms on the 13th, though it is exclusive to the Epic Games Store and the Switch port is still in development. No specific date for when that ships. Put this on your radar. The roguelike deck builder is a genre that I featured more than a few times in this slot, and for good reason. A hell of a lot of indie devs are working on these sorts of games. That's not a bad thing, mind you, since I can think of more than a dozen of these types of games that have all offered up their own unique, very worthwhile spin on the formula. This one is called Power Chord, and it's essentially a rock and roll opera made playable. Your band consists of a destructive bassist, a defensive drummer, an attack guitarist, and a support singer, and each of these have their own unique abilities that can be combined with random cards you pull from the deck. The goal is to move from dive bars to the main stage, cutting through the legions of darkness as you do so. This is from Big Blue Bubble, who last year released a very solid Dead Cells-like called Forgone, currently sitting at very positive on Steam. I think this looks pretty cool, and if you agree, then the best thing you can do to help the developer out is wishlisted. I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. No specific date or release window for this one yet. Sort of free stuff time, and since we're now into the second week of May, all of the sort of free stuff is now live across PS Plus, Games with Gold, and Twitch Prime, so be sure to grab it. Key highlights include Yoku's Island Express on Games with Gold, Curse of the Dead Gods and Tribes of Midgard on PS Plus, and Dead Space 2 on Twitch Prime. This week, the Epic Game Store is doing their regular thing, except they've got an absolute absolutely top tier banger in the mix. Right now you can grab Terraforming Mars, which is a digital board game of sorts where you make decisions about how to best colonize the red planet. Commencing the 13th of May, Epic will be giving away two games. The first is Jotun Valhalla Edition, which is a stylish hand-drawn adventure game drawing from the deep well of Norse mythology. The second game, 
is Prey, the immersive sim masterpiece from Arcane, makers of the Dishonored franchise. If you have not yet played this game, then goddamn, I am so jealous because you get to experience this for the first time and I really wish I could do that again. Set aboard a beautiful Art Deco inspired haunted house in space, Prey's brilliant visuals, music, setting and immersive sim gameplay are an absolute high point for the genre, even if it does fall off a little in its closing act. Do me a favour, if you end up finishing this one then please buy the DLC, Prey Moon Crash. While it's not as grand in scale or spectacle, Moon Crash is an even more smartly designed version of what was already a very smartly designed game. You'll love it, trust me. Game Pass got its monthly refresh and it's not looking too shabby at all. Citizen Sleeper has been doing the rounds on social media as many people are loving that one, meant to be fantastically written. Ewood and Chronicles Rising, Loot River and Trek to Yomi are all on there as well, as I've mentioned earlier. I didn't mention earlier that this War of Mines Final Cut was also coming to Game Pass, so there you go. And finally, NHL 2022 is a hockey game, aka UFC on Ice. I still remember playing the old NHL games and just trying to trigger those like fighting mini games as often as I could. You guys remember those? Do they even still have those in modern NHL games? I'm gonna guess not, but they really should. That shit was awesome. Our feel good story for the week reminds us of the enduring importance of science, technology, engineering, and maths to the advancement of our species because finally, we have taught rats how to play Doom. Yes, I know, hold your game journalist jokes, please. I know they were coming, so I'll stop you right there. Let's just celebrate the achievements of one Victor Noth, who looked at people porting Doom to things like calculators and fridges and said, no, you're doing it wrong. I'm gonna port Doom to rats. The setup is similar to a Skinner box, the same one in which myself and a number of other Destiny fans find themselves permanently ensnared. The ball on which the rat is placed allows him to free run, simulating movement on screen when he does so, and when his progress is blocked by an imp, the rat presses a button to give the imp both barrels, resuming the flow of precious sugar water that he so desperately craves. Come to think of it, that's a lot like that. That's actually exactly what Destiny is. Wait, are we the rats? Damn you, Bongo! You got us! You got us so good! Alright, I'm out. I need some sugar water. So if you want to give daddy some sugar, then be sure to hit the like button. And yep, I know just how bad that sounded. If you're in for the long haul, then perhaps consider hitting the subscribe button. Since we've got some cool stuff coming later this month, which I can't quite share yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Be sure to ding the notification bell so you'll never miss a video. Thank you for stopping by. I always appreciate it. Take good care of yourself, and I'll see you in the next video. Don't you just hate it when some big TV show is premiering on a streaming service and you renew your subscription, log in, search around for it, only to then discover that it's not available in your region? Believe me, this is a pain that we in Australia know all too well, since a ridiculous amount of content is geoblocked for us, and that really sucks. Enter Surfshark VPN, the best means of sidestepping all that geoblock nonsense, so you can watch whatever the hell you want, wherever the hell you damn please. In just a few simple clicks, Surfshark lets you connect to their global network of nodes. So in one moment, you're in Sydney, and the next, you're in London, and the next, you're in Delaware, for some reason. Point is, Surfshark lets you enjoy TVs, movies, and games without having to worry about geoblocking, and depending on where you live, that's a pretty big deal. That's not all though. Surfshark VPN is also the best means of protecting your online data. Your passwords, your IP addresses, your personal information. Surfshark VPN encrypts your online data, protecting it from identity thefts and hacks, and their clean web feature automatically blocks over 1 million known malicious websites, phishing methods, and other threats. In 2022, we can't just trust every website we're shopping on to keep our data safe. We have to take our own steps to protect our data, otherwise these sorts of hacks and scams are inevitable. You can use Surfshark on multiple devices at once, which is something that almost no other VPN allows for. It's available on pretty much every platform you can think of. It has 24 seven customer support and it also has a full 30 day money back guarantee. Best of all, they're offering a special discount to viewers of this channel, giving you a massive 83% discount and three months free when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Click the link in the description below or visit surfshark.deals forward slash skillup. Thanks Surfshark for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.